Gift Biz Unwrapped, Episode 62. I said no. He said, keep thinking about it. I said no. He said, keep thinking about it. I said no. He said, okay, I'm going to set up coffee. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Welcome to Gift Biz Unwrapped, your source for industry-specific insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And now, here's your host, Sue Monheit. Hi there, I'm Sue, and welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick and mortar store, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. And today we have joining us Carl Benson. Carl has been the owner of Cooks of Crocus Hill in St. Paul, Minnesota for the last 15 years. Cooks is a brand-driven, specialty culinary retailer and educator focused on the belief that life happens in the kitchen. Carl is also the founder and creator of Life Recipe, a corporate wellness program focusing on changing the way people eat and improving their relationship with food. Carl has a passion for creating and delivering a thoughtful, stylish, and energetic brand experience. He's worked on a variety of branding projects with domestic and international clients, including Target, Health Partners, and the Mayo Clinic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carl, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, and as our listeners know, we like to get a little bit of a different insight into who you are by having you describe a motivational candle. So if you could create any type of candle you wanted, what color would it be and what would the quote be on your candle? The color would be white and the quote is, I was born a man, I died a doctor. Ooh, what does that mean? <laughs> it's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> I guess it's kind of a sad quote in some respects that there was a guy, his name is Martin Lloyd-Jones and he wrote in the context of as people sort of live their lives, as they start at one thing, they get motivated to become something else and they ultimately died what they achieved, they didn't die what they were. And he said that whole cemeteries could be filled with the same sad tombstone. And that is that I was born a man and I died a doctor. It's motivating to me, I suppose, because I think I'd prefer to be always having lived the man, not having lived the end result or the goal or the objective that I didn't become something. Maybe I became a better person or I became more fulfilled in my pursuit of humanity, if that's the right word, or, or my soul, you know, soul kind of an odd word. But yeah, I know what you're saying, because especially as entrepreneurs, and when we have a business, our whole life seems to be revolving around that business. And it ends up being that you associate yourself with what your business is, not with the type of person that you are. Exactly. That if you become defined by your business, then you're not defined by the person that you are or wish to be or have become or wish to pursue. Yeah. It's a deep quote if you really think about it. And it is so easy. I mean, what do we do when we're at networking meetings or you're, even you're meeting somebody at a social event? What's the first thing we usually ask? Oh, well, what do you do? Yep. <laughs> you What's know? your job? Where yeah. do you work? Yeah, help me understand you by what you do. Exactly. And I think it's important to understand that there is a whole nother human being besides just what you do for your career, whether you're in your own business or not. You yes. work for a corporation, whatever. Wonderful. All right. So I want to talk. I'm so excited because I have known cooks before I even knew about you, Carl, because I used to get your brochures when they, and I shouldn't even call it a brochure. I think it was a catalog when you used to send those out via mail. So I knew about the business. I love cooking as a hobby. So now to know you and to hear the story about how the whole business developed is super exciting to me. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty fun business. Yeah. So I want you to take it away from the beginning in terms of how you got connected with Cooks and ultimately became an owner. I live here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm from Chicago. I moved up here in 1990 and I left my Chicago corporate job behind, moved to Minnesota, ultimately after searching for a new position. I sort of got the dream position of my life working for a multinational packaging company with a very state-of-the-art facility in Mexico. And they asked me to be the director of export sales. So I had every market outside of Mexico, which included the US, Europe, and the Far East. And it was a very specialized item, big demand globally. And after all the negotiations, ultimately, they wanted me to move back to Dallas, where I had started years before. 
and decided I wanted to stay. I'd moved three times and didn't want to make another move. So I sort of left the corporate world. I did a few things here trying to figure out sort of my next path. And I always cooked dinner for my next door neighbor. He had a young family and we didn't have kids at that point. So, and I like to cook and Russ liked to pay for dinner. So uh, that worked he, out. <laughs> it was awesome. Every Sunday afternoon, he'd swing by after he came back from church and he'd say, here's 40 bucks. I'm thinking lamb tonight. Can you make up something with lamb? So I would go to the grocery store, get the food, cook it at my house, and then bring the food over to Russ and Nancy's house. And then we'd have dinner with them and their family. And, and then Russ would do the dishes. And sometime during the week, I'd get my dishes back. So uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it worked out really well. And at one of these gatherings, he had a friend of his that he'd invited for dinner. And I was talking with this other gentleman, his name was David. And he was asking me about I had started a software business with some other guys and I was at a loggerhead with, say, the managing partner. And David said, well, you like to cook, so you should go check out Cooks of Crocus Hill. And I didn't really know. I mean, I'd forgotten where it was. And he said, oh, it's that cooking store up on Grand Avenue. And I said, well, I, man, it's kind of depressing in there. So I've, I only went there once and I haven't been back. And I don't know anything about retail and I know less about a cooking store. So yeah, it's probably not something that I'd like to pursue. Were they looking for somebody at that time? Is that why he was suggesting it or just because of your passion for cooking? No, David knew the lady who owned it. Her name is Martha Kemmer. And Martha had started it in 19, I think she started it in 1973 or 74. And this was probably 91. So they'd gone through some evolutions and changes. And Martha was pulled in a lot of different directions with her family and family business. And she really needed someone that was going to run it and take it over and just sort of go for it. So she was actively um, looking for somebody. At she that was looking. Yes. Got it. The only time I worked in a retail store was I worked at the Tom McCann shoe store in high school. So I. <laughs> That's a name from the past. <laughs> you know I think. Yeah. I said, no. He said, keep thinking about it. I said, no. He said, keep thinking about it. I said, no. He said, okay, I'm going to set up coffee. And I was like, David, I, I don't really want to do this. And he said, well, just do it for me. When you meet Martha, you'll fall in love with her and things will go from there. So I don't know, after dessert or something, I relented and said, all right, you set up coffee and I'll have coffee. So that was on Sunday. I got a call that she could meet on Thursday. So I met with her on Thursday. I met with her business advisor on Monday. They made me an offer on Tuesday. I quit on Wednesday and 10 short days, my whole life changed. It was the single most pivotal and possibly the most important decision in my career anyway, or in my life even, my, my life. I look back on it now and think, it was such a fast and easy decision that where was my resistance on the front end? And so it's been awesome. Yeah. So Carl, that's crazy that you turn things around that fast. What was it that she said? Because you were so resistant, it sounded like you just didn't think that that was something that you'd be interested in. What was the trigger that got you interested enough to make a change so quickly? I think it was her. Martha's just lovely, lovely person. And I mean, I was really clear. I had no desire to be a shopkeeper. There's some, I suppose, romance to the, not I suppose, there's a ton of romance to cooking and food and all that kind of thing. But I really wasn't wired to walk around the store in my cork sold shoes and sell pots <laughs> and pans for a living. So I think we aligned on a vision for what the business could be and that there was so much more to it than just a transactional side of selling pots and pans or selling potato peelers that if we did something good, it was about experience and it was about life and it was about connection. And Martha got it. And for whatever reason, at that juncture in my life, I found that sort of story to be super compelling. And it was easy. It was an ultimately an easy decision. It changed my whole life. I had to take a big step back. I was stepping off the uh, corporate train, if you will, and stepping onto the independent tricycle. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge life change, but it was sure. awesome. But kudos to you because you clearly felt that it was right and you took the opportunity while it was there and while it was presented to you because who knows if next week she would have been talking to someone else who would have been interested and if you would have just paused for a while or thought that you needed to reconsider or just really think about it too long, the opportunity could have passed you by. It could have passed me by or they could have, I think, ultimately because I was so honest in what I was looking for. And, you know, I, you know, there were the other people I'm sure. And I, I just have heard over the years, yeah, just the story, as the story gets handed down, you know, from generation to generation, as it were, the other people who they talked to were retail people, they were store managers, and they were shopkeepers, and someone who really connected to the brand, and connected to the work. And ultimately, Martha decided that 
her vision for the business was that it wasn't about the same thing. We shared the vision and that mine was different than anybody else's. And she took a huge risk on me and I took a huge risk with her. But it was the connection point was at a much higher level. And that's probably why we're still doing what we're doing. There's a couple of things here I want to highlight for our listeners. The first thing is, and this is something that's just become a realization to me recently, and Carl, this is what you experienced, is sometimes people who are close to us, whether it's family or friends, recognize things in us that we don't recognize in ourselves. Your friend David kept saying to you over and over again, no, you got to look at this opportunity. I see this possibly for you. You've got to consider this opportunity. And had he not done that, I think like you are going to owe him dinners for the rest of your life, probably. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Because had he not pushed you and pushed you, you would have never had coffee and ultimately gone the direction that you did. So that's the first thing, you guys, is if you have friends who keep pulling out to you some trait that you have, some skill, and you just aren't seeing it, at least rethink it and pay attention to what they're saying and consider what they're focusing and emphasizing about who you are. So I would even add, if you don't mind, I'll add to that. No, absolutely. I'll say that I have a friend who's an organizational development coach, and he's also a hippie, like was a real 1968 drive the micro bus that he bought in Minnesota to Southern California to be a, his life work was to be a hippie. And now fast forward to today, he does development work for both individuals and companies. And Patrick has a, his sort of belief is that if you're open to everything around you. I think what happens is we tend to get so zeroed in on our intentions and desires that we lose sight of other opportunities. So the serendipity of just David coming after me and me ultimately, whatever the motivation was, if I was just to get him off my back or I thought, well, it doesn't matter if it's this good, I'll at least have a cup of coffee. That being open to that because you never know where it's going to come from. In the case of your friends telling you this is something you should pursue, or you're reading an article in the paper and something strikes you, or you're place of worship and somebody in your congregation says, hey, you should consider this, that, or the other. It's just being open to the opportunities that life might present itself. And if we're closed, then those things, we just miss them altogether. We don't even have the chance to say yes or no, because they just sort of pass us by. Well stated. Thank you for adding on. That's fabulous. The second thing that I wanted to focus on was you talking about the fact that, no, you weren't weren't interested in being in aisles and selling pots and pans for the rest of your life. And one thing all of us need to remember is that being an employee in a shop, whether you do the books or you do inventory or you're on the sales floor, is very different than being the owner of the business. There's a whole different ballgame when you own something, when you're an entrepreneur. So those of you who are thinking of considering a business, if you are working in a retail shop and you're like, oh, I could do this so much better. They're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of what a business owner has to go through. If you like business, you like directing, steering the ship, if you will. You were hearing Carl say that he really didn't like cooks in the beginning. It looked stale or dark or not an exciting environment. We're going to get into how that's changed now, but think a little differently than just owning versus experiencing being in a shop or working for a shop. Two very different things. Would you yes. say anything else about that, Carl? Uh, well, I think it's come up both inside and outside of my business that identifying what your connection to the business is and how you get inspired and how you wish to grow based on your desire. So in my case, I didn't want to be a shopkeeper. So we made a lot of decisions over the last 17 years that aligned with, I wasn't going to work the cash register and I mean, not that I can't, but I always felt like if we were going to get to where we wanted to go, that I needed to be looking, you know, maybe at a higher level. Mm -hmm. And in the, in our time in business, I've met many, many people who have very successful small businesses, cooking stores around the country, where the owner has a completely different perspective. They want to be the shopkeeper. Their goal is to be on the floor and talking with customers every day. They might do all the buying and be the shopkeeper and do the payroll. And that's their connection point to their business. And that's where they find inspiration. So in the environment when that person who finds success at the detail side of their business starts looking to expand, then it becomes important to say, where are your skill sets, desires, and intentions? Because what often happens, and I think this is any small business, when you go from one location that achieves a level of success, whatever that is, and then you start to look at a second location your relationship with your business changes. 
it's not as easy to continue to be the happy, inspired shopkeeper when you have two shops or your shop gets big or you add a restaurant component to your shop or you are taken away by the internet side of things. Holding your vision for your relationship with the business is paramount. And without that vision, it's hard to make really consistent, sustainable decisions because you're sort of like a boat in the water, if we borrow that analogy, and the waves keep bashing against you. And the way that you're going to be successful is to be clear in where you're going, to be the rudder. And that rudder is first and foremost what your contribution is yourself Mm -hmm. is to your business. So working on the business versus in the business, if you will. Yeah, exactly. And you know, when you're small and when you're starting and when your inspiration is to improve upon the people before you or to have a better buying program or whatever, whatever your stake in the game is, it works great because the context is perfect and the scale and the size is perfect for your engagement. It's when you start to grow that the opportunity for reevaluating your connection to it becomes important. Really good point. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. So let's talk now, how has everything evolved? Take us through a little bit over the course of time. You jumped in, now you're working in Cooks, and we described at the top of the show what Cooks is today. How did all of that start to grow and change with your influence? Well, we got stronger and we added better systems at the main store. The main location is in St. Paul, but systems are expensive and team is expensive and point of sale system is expensive and all that stuff. So at some point we had to make the decision, you know, am I ready to go back to being the shopkeeper or have I reassessed my relationship with cooks because the scale is such that I can take some of the roles that other people have and will stay this size and, you know, think about putting the kids through college and all that stuff. And at just about every turn, we decided that the brand opportunity was significant enough and the our relationship with the community was robust enough that we needed an, you know, another location that instead of scaling back, we wanted to scale up. And then once we start in the scale up progression, then it's always easier to say, let's add another one or where's the opportunity here? Or, where's the growth? I always tell our team that retail is like being a shark. If you're not growing, you're dying. The minute you stop being aware of your competition or stop being aware of trend in food or stop being inspired to go find the new design of the potato peeler and stop engaging your customers because everybody sort of knows and they're complacent and they're comfortable, then that's when everything starts to decline. So you have to be prepared for that. So in our case, we work with my OD friend, we set systems in place, we're constantly assessing and reassessing and growing and changing and evolving and it works for us. And maybe that's more motivated by me than life. But so we, we just are constantly trying to better ourselves. Solid piece of advice, Carl. Thank you very much. Hopefully all of you were really listening intently. If not, rewind that last piece once again. A couple of questions for you, Carl. And I don't know the answers to these, so I'll be very curious. Would you say that as you talk about systems and all of that, when you start adding a second store, is the second store the hardest versus then three, four, five, like just getting everything in place to have a second location? And then is it more repetitive because it's a similar concept? Does does that make sense? It does, totally. I would say that the growth from one to two is exponential. It goes from 100 to 300 because you run into questions of how do you supply? What's the inventory look like if you're ordering? In our case, At first, when we set up the second location, we had to set a second delivery spot, which from all of our vendors meant we had to meet minimums for a second delivery location. So each location had its own delivery minimums. And after probably three or four years of that, we did some assessment and decided that we were better served by paying the expense of a warehousing space so we could buy and send everything off of one, but then off of one purchase order, so to speak. But then to achieve that, we needed to upgrade our POS, our inventory management and our ordering system, because our original system was set up, you know, you could do a series of ones, but when you did the first two, it wasn't robust enough to consider everything with that centralized delivery piece. So it took us, I would say probably five or six years to figure out the second location, just how to run it and run it efficiently. And then four years ago, we bought a competitor in town. They had gone out of business and we bought all their assets and signed a new lease in the same space. And in that case, we spent three months getting everything ready. We took over the space and we closed it down, did an inventory, and we were up and running in four days. And after 10 days, it was like we'd been running it 
for 10 years. So but we that could done, integrate into all your systems you already have. Totally. Okay. By that point, we had a system that is robust enough to accommodate three, and now we're going to open a fourth. But that's not a modest undertaking. And if I go back to an earlier comment, it's at that point that you're, as the owner, your relationship with your business changes. If you wanted to be a shopkeeper, you are no longer a shopkeeper. You need to be the IT guy. You need to be the team motivator. You need to build systems where of communication and consistency across multiple locations. So your whole relationship with your business changes. So how well prepared are you for that change is always the big question. Okay. Another question for you. And gift biz listeners, you know, we talk about this a lot too, is when you're opening a business, how are you going to be different from other people out there who are selling somewhat of a similar product? What is your unique selling proposition? So Carl, let me ask you that. How are you different then from anybody else, either in your area or also all over because you do mail order as well? How are you different? You know, where our differences that we don't talk the idea of experiential. We actually live it and plan for it and define it and train to it. And so that when we have consistency in all the three locations, we are small. Our footprint is very small. We have 2,800 or 3,200 square feet of retail versus our competitors, the big guys, the national can be up to 10,000 square feet of retail. They tend to be the, you know, their buying is we're going to purchase everything and we're going to let you decide which set of cookware you want or which knife you want by looking at our display. And in our case, we do all the legwork. We test everything. Nothing that we sell in the store has, I should say, everything we sell in the store has been run through the school or tasted by multiple people on our team so that we know where the olive oil comes from. And in many cases, we've met the vendor that sells it or not the vendor, even the producer, the farm. So we do that curating. If you say ours is a curated, not like a museum, but that everything we sell, we know works. Our team has all tried it and tested it. It's easy to say, I'm just going to buy product out of a catalog and offer it up. And if people like it, great. And if they don't, we'll get rid of it. But in our case, because we have, we're limited on space, then we make sure that what we're offering is true to our values and true to our vision for our business and that we can stand behind it because we all use it. That is the Got key it. driver for us. And so, you know, for example, we talk about the web. Our challenge is we're not just going to offer 6,000 products up on the web. We have to figure out exactly what our position on the web is and, and how we're going to offer it and how can we bring some level of the cook's experience to the web experience because, you know, Amazon has the Amazon experience and which in my opinion is not much of an experience. It's super transactional. You just, everybody there buys on price. Well, we don't have the marketing reach. We don't have the horsepower. We don't have the name recognition to attract people. So we got to go the other direction. And that is we have to find a way to bring the cook's experience alive in a virtual environment. And we're probably 5% of the way towards that end result right now. Mm -hmm. But on your way. And I think it's really important, whether it's an experience in store or online, that's what separates you so much from other people. Because, and I talk about this a lot too, you can have a similar product, but who you are as a personality. And when I say who, I'm meaning your business as well as you. How do you treat people when they come in the store? How's your web interaction? Do your pages load well? Is it easy to navigate through your site? What types of products do you have? What kind of services? And all of that is not as easy to copy if someone's trying to outdo you. They can buy the same products that you can, but they can't provide a similar experience because that goes back to you and your personality and what you're able to do in your company for your customers. Well, and that, Sue, I think is about, again, doing the legwork, doing the groundwork, saying, who are we? Comes up all the mm -hmm. time. And maybe not so much in the last couple of years as it did in the beginning. And it's easy to get lured into the siren song of what we think people want. Today, we think people want red pots with black handles. So we go out and we buy everything that we're anticipating that the customer wants, which is fine if you guess right. But the minute it transitions to blue pots with yellow handles and you're eyeballs deep in red pots with black handles, now you're scrambling to try and shift and change direction. So for us, years and years and years ago, as we decided that it was extremely important for us to define who we are. If we're going to offer the red pot with the black handle, here's why we're going to offer it. And here's why we believe it's a more compelling story to you. And here's how it fits in the context of our vision for our business and sort of the brand of our business. And if then the secondary challenge becomes how effectively can you communicate that? And for us, it became more heartfelt, if you will, or more soulful, more legitimate that we wanted our environments to be 
a reflection of the brand. And the brand is not me. Our brand is not Carl Benson, or it's not my wife, Marie Dwyer, or it's not Susie, our events marketing person. It's not Lindsay, our business manager. We sit down and say, this is the brand. We are all stewards. We're the current stewards of the Cook's brand. So the brand has its own life. And the vision that happens is inclusive and it's expansive. And it's about everyone's experience with food, everyone on our team and everyone who comes in the store. So capturing that and building a system around, you know, in essence, an, an entity that we'd like to say has its own life and its own soul. And if we're just captaining it at this moment, then what is it and how are we delivering it and how are we defining it and how are we connecting to it and how are we making that experience come alive? And that's an even more difficult task, but if you can find a way to bring it together, it's even that much more rewarding. Well, it's a winning task based on what's going on with you guys, for sure. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Some days I wonder. <laughs> All right, let's go. That's a great segue, Carl. Let's go to one of those days when the clouds are hanging over some project. Something's not going well. You're having a struggle. Give us a point in time when there was a really big challenge that you had to deal with and how you overcame that issue. We had a store in, I guess it was the original enclosed mall in the United States in Edina, Minnesota. And our concept is more Main Street. So everything is really in your neighborhood at the corner of Oak and Main or whatever you want. Main and First, that kind of thing. And we were growing and there was an opportunity to go into the complete redevelopment of this sort of landmark enclosed shopping mall. We had a lot of consternation and conversation and decided we were going to take a run at it. And it was, you know, within three months of our signing a lease, they signed an Apple store. They had a mini store. They had all the hot buzz, buzz, buzz retail were going to be our neighbors. And we signed the lease and then 45 days later, the mall sold and the new owners stopped everything. So the entire mall went back into a tailspin. And within a year, we were saying, we can't stay in business here another six months because we'll be out of business at that point. So we had to figure out a creative way to get out of that very, very trying situation. There were plenty of times in that four months where I didn't sleep and I thought, oh my God, we've worked so hard for everything. And one bad decision or one change, you know, one great decision set my life on a new course, you know, eight years prior. And one decision that we have no control over that they sold the mall is going to be the, the X that sort of brings it all to a close. And that was really, I mean, we, that was a very, very difficult time. So, and in that case, we just put our head down and negotiated the best we could and slashed costs and reorganized and decided that we were going to do whatever we needed to do to keep it alive. And we did. And it took about four years to recover from that experience. And we learned from it. So, I get lots of calls from malls and I don't return any of them. Is there any overriding learning that you would give our listeners about that whole experience? It's probably the back to the same sort of life philosophy that we have and that you have to be open and creative and create possibilities and opportunities. If you have possibilities, you can still move. And it's when you lose all possibilities and you get channeled into one path and one ends that creativity starts to flounder. And if you can't be creative, then you can't find a way out of it. And you sort of lose hope. I myself would lose hope in that environment. So we were successful because we were just, I refused to let it all sort of go away. Sheer will and creativity, having a really great team and really good support and that culture that's still Mm -hmm. still strong today. Sometimes you got to just bust your backside to make a really difficult time, you know, to get past a really difficult time. And it's nothing more than hard work and perseverance. Yeah, and driving then, through it, driving yeah. through the problem one way and or I'm the not, other. I'm not so Pollyanna to say that there aren't times where there are no more options and there are no more choices and the really hard decision has to be made. We've been able to sort of get around those crossroads in our business, but they're there and they're mm-hmm. lurking and they're, you know, want to step in them. But Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think this is a good example, though, that your business is always evolving and changing. And sometimes it's the environment around you, not necessarily your business but you have to react. So just because you have a winning business model and you're making money today does not mean that it's going to be the same thing next year. Things happen. What's going to happen online with Instagram and Facebook? And are they going to start stealing sales versus in-store experiences? And you have to always continually be analyzing, looking and recreating your business to continue to get better and stay up with the times. The other thing I think really important for everyone to remember is what Carl went through was not failure. Okay. We always think, you know, oh, if I, you know, everything has to be absolutely perfect. When you come to a challenging time, they took a risk of going to a different type 
you know, more of a strip mall type thing or indoor mall, I guess I'd say, versus the main street single location, maybe it would have worked out great. In this case, it didn't, but it's not necessarily a failure. It's a learning and you work through it. You just, that's something that all of us as business owners have to realize there are some things that just aren't going to work. It doesn't mean that we're a failure. It's part of your journey. It's a bump along the road. For you guys, it sounded like it took a few years because it was a big event, but still you just drive through, recover and carry on. And tell us where you are today. What's the most exciting thing with Cooks today before we move on? We are opening, we're maybe some of the only wacky people in the country that are actually opening another bricks and mortar. There's a neighborhood here in Minneapolis called the North Loop. It's every town in America has its version, whether it's Brooklyn or the meatpacking district in Chicago or down along the Embarcadero in San Francisco. It's the old warehouse space that is coming alive, being regentrified, turning into multi-unit housing and high density traffic. So we have found a really funny, interesting little spot in a very hipster neighborhood and We're going to take a run to see if we can tweak our product assortment and sort of tweak our vision for that space to become a little more food centric and a little less pots and pan centric and (laughs) see if we can make a run at uh, a fourth location. That sounds very exciting. It is. (laughs) You know, and I don't give up on brick and mortar. I got to tell you, I think it was Gary Vaynerchuk not within the last 60 days or so was talking about the fact that still only between 15 and 19% of dollars are actually going through online sales. There is still a ton of opportunity in brick and mortar. So don't get discouraged. Yes, a lot of people come in, they comparison shop, then they buy online. They're not your customer long-term. And they're certainly not the ones who are looking for the buyer experience, as Carl's been talking about before. Well, and I think that some of that is all those statistics. In fact, I read not the same author, but another article saying that in our channel, it's still in the seven or 8% total. It's one level to define it. And it's another level to sort of practicality live it. People are going to shop online and people are going to look for products in that sort of cook's experience. Our vendors are recognizing it. We see increasingly the folks that we buy product from are holding a map pricing line. They're cutting off Amazon. They're cutting off you know, some of the big violators of pricing structure. And it depends on your, you know, the environment and the sort of business category that your listeners are pursuing. And so the ultimate answer is to work with your vendors and ask what they're doing to support what it is that you're trying to do. And I think ultimately, if Amazon is holding the same pricing guidelines as Cook's is or as, you know, Williams-Sonoma is, then we can compete. It's when, you know, people who are price shoppers are going to buy based on price and Amazon is going to be attractive to them. But you can't call Amazon and say, I'm making a cassoulet. What would the best pot be for me to purchase? Because I have 10 people coming for dinner on Saturday night. You're not going to get an answer to that. You can stop into your independent place and they'll say, well, show me the recipe and I'll help you find ingredients and we'll source it. And here's the best pot and here's how you serve it. And here's some candles that go along with your idea, et cetera, et cetera. Amazon can't compete in that environment. So as long as the vendors are aligned behind what each of their clients are trying to achieve, then if there's parity, then independents can compete. They just have to compete in a different way. Right. Relationships. It goes back to relationships. They're trusting you because as you were talking about before, you've already tested and you know that you've hand selected products. You're just not going to stock everything. And then being able that one-on-one, you know, being able to come in and ask, come in or call and ask for recommendations and comments. So yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Carl, we're going to swing now into the reflection section. This is a look at you. You've shared a bunch of things already in terms of how you've been successful along the way, but I have a couple of specific questions for you. If you think back to being a young boy, what would you say you call upon to remain successful and motivated and just driven for your business? What's your trait? It's just persistence and perseverance. I don't give up easy and I've never given up easy. I just, you know, I just keep my family, you know, you know, you have that question around the dinner table of, of uh, if you were a dog, what, what kind of dog would you be? And in my case, with our entire family and all the kids, and, you know, we have a bunch of kids and they always refer to me as a terrier. I'm just, <laughs> I'm relentless and that's good and bad. You know, there are times where I should let go and just move on, but I can't. I'm wired like a terrier. I'm just going to keep digging to trying to find that fox in the hole. And I'm not going to give up until I'm either 
chewed my legs off or I, <laughs> I get it. And so there's, that's for me as my, it's a good and a bad. Yeah. And if you believe strongly enough in what you're doing, that's what makes you successful because you drive through, you find the solution. If one thing doesn't work, you go for something else until you've gotten the result that you need. Exactly. All right. When you think of your day-to-day work environment, is there some tool or something that you call upon every day that is like the like you could not do without? Yes, it's called the Mobius. It's a communication model that we we've built our entire business around it. So the question that whether it's in a moment of challenge or a moment of opportunity, a vision opportunity, or we're trying to figure out how to solve a particular problem. The Mobius model is written by a guy named Bill Stockton, and he's a cultural anthropologist. And he started studying how primitive societies communicate. And then he took his learnings and applied it to modern day people. And then ultimately how to build a communication model for an organization. So when you have a challenge, it's not a who's at fault, who's to blame, how are we going to find out someone that we can point our fingers at and say that this person or this situation really is responsible for where we find ourselves. Instead, in a more holistic way, it's to say, where are we? What's the challenge? What's present in our business currently that is contributing to this challenge being a challenge? And what's missing that if it were present would enable us to overcome or work our way around this challenge? So the missings that you define then become the steps and the action items that the organization uses to get around the challenge. It works equally well with What's our vision? We're going to open a new store in North Loop. What do we want it to be? What's present that contributes to that new vision? What's missing that if it were present would enable that vision to be that much stronger? We follow this Mobius path. I mean, we're terrier-like, if I borrow from before, (laughs) in how we follow it. We don't waver. We use that tool and we use that model and our whole business is built around it. And it is incredibly powerful if you can work it and stick with it and be consistent in how you execute off of it. All right. So 100% hands down on the Mobius method. The path that we went down with understanding the Mobius was like so many other things. It's probably an eight year. Well, we, we've actually, we use it for our annual planning thing. And I took a picture the other day and I can send it to you, but this is our 12th year that we followed the same annual planning program. And I still have all the charts that we've done. I put them all up on a wall and took a photo and sent it to a friend of mine. It's almost like dedicating your life to a yoga practice. It's not superficial. It's either jump in and go with it and stick with it. Or there are certainly pieces in there that you can pull out and use and, you know, sort of move forward. But I think if you really understand it and study it and do the heavy lifting, it's there for the long haul. It's that sustainable model that we're looking for. You have piqued my curiosity for sure. (laughs) Okay, great. All right. So in the end here, Carl, I would like to invite you to dare to dream. I would like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. This is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? Well, it's a great gift and and I appreciate that. It's actually kind of easy for me to answer and that is that I used to think for a long time that I wanted to be widely considered to be sort of the best in our category. And two years ago, we won the Global Innovators Award for the Housewares Association. So we were the winner from the United States. It's, you know, it's a a juried submission with photos and all kinds of descriptors of our business. And congratulations on that. That's huge. It's it's (laughs) kind of funny. And William Sonoma won it, you know, say seven or eight years ago. So we were selected three years ago at the end of 2013. So we won the US Innovators Award. And then we went to the sort of global championship. And there were 25 retail operations from around the world, Germany and England. And we were picked as the, they told us we were the first unanimous decision in the 12 years they've had the award between the judging panel. Wow. Um, everybody voted us first. Their first round was, hey, who do you think's the best one this year? And everyone said, cooks, 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 cooks. So I said it was the first time ever that there was a consensus first balloting winner. And it was pretty cool. There were four winners the year that we one of the 28 submissions or 23. So after that, I thought, I guess I have to pick a different vision. So I no longer felt like, well, I want to be widely considered to be the best in our category. Now I think I'd like to be considered as the best in a category of one, that if we are living our vision and we're creating something that is truly us and unique to us, then we will be unique. And 
at that point, we can say we're the best in a category of one. And I think that would be, for me, the ultimate sort of gift or vision for what cooks could become. Which means you will have created your very own category. Exactly. Period. And we'll be the only one in it. Well, Carl, such interesting information. I am so glad I knew that this interview was going to prove exactly that. If someone wanted to get in touch with you and Cooks, what's the single place that someone should go if they want to see and learn about Cooks of Crocus Hill? It would be our website. That's www.cooksofcrocushill.com. Wonderful. All right, Gift Biz listeners, you know on the show notes page, I will also have that website repeated one more time, also social media sites and any other links that make sense for our interview today, as well as some of the other information in terms of some of the detail that we've talked about during the show here. Carl, thank you so much. I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. You've shared some really, really interesting points. And it's so cool. Not in you just at the very end, just land this Global Innovators Award on us. <laughs> <laughs> so that was super awesome. I wish we could take it on longer and talk a little bit more about that. But congratulations on that. There is not a doubt in my mind that you at some point are going to be the winner of a category of one. And may your candle always burn bright. Thank you. My pleasure. Learn how to work smarter while developing and growing your business. Download our guide called 25 Free Tools to Enhance Your Business and Life. It's our gift to you and available at giftbizunwrap.com slash tools. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us for the next episode. Today's show is sponsored by The Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? Customization is more popular now than ever. Brand your products with your logo or print a happy birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on iTunes. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. And thank you to those who have already left a rating and review. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey as well.